Hello, everybody. Welcome to Therapy Dog Talk. My name is Sherry. My pup's names are Sunny and Riley. And each week we talk with different therapy dog teams around the world about the impact that they're making in their area. If you're just getting started or not sure where to get started, we have a free guide you can find at freeguide.therapydogtalk.com. And we also have a community you can join at community.therapydogtalk.com. Today, we're going to be talking with Estella and her palms, Monty and Finn. They're a registered therapy dog team in Tennessee, and I'm really looking forward for you to get to know them. We've got Fran. This is Finn. You like to join in on every Zoom call, every live call. Aww. He's here for it. <laughs> I love that. Well, Estella, for those who don't know you, would you like to introduce yourself and your pups? Yeah. So, so I'm Estella. We're based out of Nashville, Tennessee. And like I said, this is Finn. And today is actually Finn's 13 and a half birthday. So this half birthday. Happy half birthday. And then Monty, he's over there. He will not be making an appearance today. He's a really senior dog, a Pomeranian. He is, our vet says the closest guest is 12 years old, but he's a puppy mill survivor. So there's no way to tell how old he is. Yeah. As far as therapy work, we started our therapy journey in 2016. And then both pups became registered in 2017. Okay. All right. What was it like to get them both registered around the same time? So I started with Finn. Finn is the more adaptable to it changes yeah. and new things. And so I thought we would have better success because I didn't know what I was doing. I mm-hmm. didn't even know, honestly, I didn't even know what therapy dogs were or did. Yeah. And I was one of those people that thought therapy dogs were the same classification as service dogs. I just didn't realize that it was two separate classifications. But we started our journey in 2016, and it took about a year for Finn to become registered. And I think a lot of it had to do with me because I didn't know the process. I was unfamiliar with it. We actually went through the training process for me as a handler and then for him as a dog. That part went fine. But when we went to do the team evaluation, nerves got the best of me. And I think that translated to him. And so we actually did it past our first exam, the therapy team evaluation. We did not pass it. We had to wait about six months before we could test again. And once we did that the second time, he was able to pass. So we became registered April of 2017, I think. And then Monty became registered in August of 2017. What was interesting about that was I thought, let's start with Finn first because he's the more adaptable to change, right? Mm-hmm. And because if I didn't know what I'm doing and Monty is following my lead, we're, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> we thought, let's go with Finn first. And then ironically, do you think it's really because of my nerves that I just wasn't familiar with the process that first time? We just weren't successful. Yeah. But luckily, you can take it as many times as you need to in order to pass. Yeah. And that's their pet partners, right? That's who you're registered through? Yes, we are registered through pet partners. Yeah, I, I think it's so common that people don't realize the human side of things in therapy dog work. I was just going back through my episode with Dina and Petey. She's a tester observer for ATD, and she said the most common reason people don't pass is because of the humans, not yeah. because of the dog. No, because they're supposed to follow our lead. Right. Even though they know what's coming up next or they kind of know. Because at this point, both teams have renewed twice. So now we're kind of down to a routine. But they follow us, you know. And Mm -hmm. it's so interesting to me how our emotion and our stress and our anxiety and our nervousness, even though we don't necessarily register it, they pick up on it. Mm-hmm. What was really funny going into it, I just thought, like I said, oh, it's going to be not a quicker process, but I just thought it was going to be a smoother process with Ben going first. And then Ben took like a year to get registered. And then Monty took four months. Well, you so, know what but, you were doing then. Yeah, exactly. That was my third test. That's why I feel like it was because by then we had known the process. I thought it would take longer for Monty, yeah. you know, yeah. but it didn't. Yeah. yeah. I know you have a podcast as a like self-acceptance coach, right? Yes. It's called Finding Strength of Heart. It's a trauma-informed podcast. So basically what I do is I interview guests on how they have been able to navigate and heal from their traumas. Mm -hmm. And what's really exciting, I have it planned out all the, I don't have all my ups in a row yet. But what's kind of interesting is because of my work with the therapy dog stuff that we're doing and my trauma-informed work, dogs 
go through trauma as well. Yeah. And so I'm really excited. Hopefully coming in 2024, I'm going to start a new segment or a new episode quarterly kind of thing where I focus on how dogs are able to overcome trauma because both of mine were like, Monty is a puppy mill survivor, mm-hmm. you know, and Sin was a backyard breeder, okay. horrid situation yeah. because you don't normally see Pomeranian that are his color. Mm-hmm. And so his owners saw dollar signs, but without a lot of education. Yeah. And so 12 puppies popped out and they were like, oh crap, we don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And they all got sick. They all got heartworm positive. So he had to go through treatments for that. So dogs experience trauma as yeah. well. That's an area that I haven't heard a lot about. So I'm excited to introduce that. Yeah, I was curious how you applied some of that to your work as you were trying to become a therapy dog team. Did you have to dig into your own toolbox and how you work with other people with self-acceptance and apply that to your journey? Well, actually, so... It was reverse. Okay. I didn't start my own healing and addressing my own traumas until 2020. In March of 2020, there were 10 tornadoes here in Nashville, Tennessee, and one of them blew through our apartment 10 days after the pandemic started. And so we moved four times in the matter of two months because 10 days after or 12 days after the tornado, we moved into a new apartment and we started the next day. So then we had to move again. We ended up moving four times. And then after the third move, two days after, somebody tried to climb in through my window at three o'clock in the morning. Holy country. Yeah. Which was so terrifying. My dogs barely bark. But yeah. the only reason why I even knew I was in a dead sleep was because they were barking hysterically because somebody was trying to come in through the window. So I literally opened my eye and I see a leg coming through the window. So it was after that that I was like, I need help. (laughs) There there were just so many traumas in a very short period of time. And so then it was after that that I started to realize, you know what? I have a lot to say about trauma in general, healing from Mm -hmm. trauma, and just knowing that it's not one and done. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. just because you seek help, I had to go through therapy and all that stuff. It's not like, oh, I'm healed. It's very cyclical. So Mm -hmm. in common with those, you know, but it was through that that, I started the podcast. Okay. Yeah. So we were doing therapy work before. It was kind of reversed, but it ties in so well together. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I saw that in your bio about self-acceptance. And I was like, oh, I wonder if she applied that to her journey. But it also makes sense that you learned it and then now are applying it in other areas. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Estella, how did you find out about therapy dogs in the first place? I went on Google. Okay. A week after I adopted Sin, which is in 2015, when I would go to pet him, he would naturally wrap his paws around okay. me like a hug. I was like, there's got to be a way to share that, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't know that comfort dogs were called therapy dogs. I just thought there's got to be a way to go into hospitals to comfort people. And there's got to be a way. I did. I went on Google and I searched for comfort dogs in Nashville. And then mm-hmm. eventually I found an affiliate of pet partners that's here in Nashville. So I started reading the qualifications for it, certain requirements and temperaments and everything. And I'm like, I bet we could do this. Yeah. So that was through Music City Pet Partners, right? Yes. Well, at yeah. the time, they were not called Music City oh. Pet Partners. They hear that we were trying to register. In 2017, that's when they changed their names. Okay. Yeah. They're the ones that said, oh, you need to talk to Estella. She'd be perfect. <laughs> I love working with them. One of the things that I didn't expect, I knew that Finn would have fun. And I knew Monty would fall into it and enjoy it and everything. I always said that whenever they get to a point where they're not enjoying it anymore, we're going to stop, but we're not there yet. But what I didn't expect was how much fun I would have going to do these visits. Yeah, that's awesome. What kind of surprised you along your training journey with them? I mentioned the thing about Sin not passing the first time. That really surprised yeah. me. But not really a lot surprised me as far as the training part of it, because I already felt like they're very obedient dogs. And had the good temperament for it and everything. So nothing really surprised me about that. But as far as the visiting part of it, it was trying to figure out what's a good fit to visit. Because that's one thing that you need to pay attention to based on your dog's personalities and then our own comfort level. Because like we said earlier, my emotional state, if I'm stressed, if I'm anxious, they're going to pick up on Mm -hmm. it and it's just not going to be a successful visit. So I think I was most surprised about that impact. 
I have to be emotionally stable and be confident. And I have to give props to myself because I have become a much more confident handler than I when I first started. Yeah. Do you have like a story or an example of that to kind of illustrate what you're talking about? I do. I wouldn't say the worst experience you ever had. I won't put myself or them through this again. But it was my bad. I didn't ask enough questions. Mm-hmm. And it, it was very early on after we got registered. So it was either late 2017 or 2008. We're still a pretty new team. Sounded like an exciting event. It was a corporate convention. There were like 2000 standing room only event and they had a little area where dogs could come in and they could interact with the attendees i knew it was going to be a convention i knew it was probably going to have loud music and it was probably going to be overstimulating but i didn't realize how packed it was and i'm a very claustrophobic person so we walk in and Sam was loving it because he loves people. So he's like, oh, new friends. And of course, every three steps we would get stopped because he's really cute and people wanted to pet him. We committed to stay an hour and a half and felt like we stayed for two hours. But after 40 minutes, I was like, okay, this is not. I was literally exit strategy the entire time. Like 10 minutes in, I'm like, where's the door? I couldn't see the exit. I couldn't see where we came in from. I was completely overwhelmed and there was people everywhere. Every two seconds, people were stopping and talking, then wanting to pet him. And then you can't be mean. You can't be like, no, you can't pet them. (laughs) Or like, no, we're trying to get out of here. Like We were there for them. But that's something that I learned is to consider my own comfort level too. Because if I'm super stressed and overwhelmed, then the visit's just not going to go well. So after that, I was like, I'm not going to put myself in that situation again. Yeah. And along with that, I know that your dogs volunteer in different environments. So how do you find the right environment for you and for each of your dogs? How do you know how to set yourselves up for success? Ask a lot of questions. So we get a lot of invitations. And at first, I think I was just excited about the idea of volunteering and getting to do this work because it's still doesn't ever get old when someone comes in and they see us and their eyes light up and they instantly want to hug them that never gets old but just asking the right questions first of all i see if we are available and then is it too hot is it indoor outdoor if it's too hot like if it's outside we generally don't do those in the summer is it too loud is there a lot of music going on is it a convention type thing is it a nursing home type thing is it a hospital, what's the environment? Even in a hospital, there's no music, but it's hectic. There's a lot of coming and going. That yeah. kind of environment tends to be overwhelming for Monty. For him, he loves people. So if there's an opportunity where there's a lot of people, then I tend to take sin. Or what I do is, again, he's my tester. So if there's an environment I think Monty would actually do really well with, I don't count him out. I just go, okay, let's just take sin first and let's see how he does. Yeah. And then, okay. Once I get the hang of it, then, okay, let's invite Monty to come in. Mm -hmm. We started with nursing homes because the recommendation is if you're a New York team, nursing homes are kind of the way to go just to see if it's a good fit. It wasn't a good fit for us because Finn is very social and it's little to no interaction in a lot of nursing homes. And he did not do well because he wants to interact with people. He wants people to hold him. He wants people to hug him. So we did that for a while and then we were like, no, let's explore something else. So then we moved into colleges. A lot of these universities now do final exam weeks where there's like stress buster events. So we started doing that. Side note, where was that when we were going to college? <laughs> that would have been wonderful. Where were therapy dogs at any point in my life? I have never encountered them in the wild. Oh, yeah, thank you. That's why I never knew it was a thing. I was like, whoa, you can actually do this. You can volunteer in this way. This is really cool, you yeah. know? So we moved into that and Marty still does a little bit of that. Also, we were volunteering at some of the local hospitals, visiting not with patients, but with nurses to alleviate their stress. We kind of stopped doing that after COVID for logistic reasons, health reasons. We ended up getting this new opportunity to volunteer at juvenile court. We started in October, I think, volunteering there. It's not every single month, but we started doing it pretty regularly. So I think we're ready to introduce Monty to this environment now. But we're really having a lot of fun with this juvenile court. 
again, this is one of those activities. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that this was a thing, but it's a stressful environment mm-hmm. and it's children that are in foster care or about to be placed in foster care or being considered for adoption or if the foster situation isn't working out, do they need to be moved into a different foster home? And so what they do is every six months, they do board meetings for these children and these families. They try to keep the siblings together. So a lot of times there's a group of siblings. Sometimes it's just a single child. But we go in and we just sit in on the board meetings because the entire meeting is a series of questions to the foster or prospective adoptive parents. And then there's a certain part where they start asking the children questions if they're about to be five. And it's really overwhelming to them and it's really just emotionally taxing for them. So we've seen how we'll just walk in and these kids, they just shut down. They're super shy. There's a room for us strangers, really. And then they see Sam and then they want to hug him and then they start to open up and they start to talk. So that's been really heartwarming. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's really great. Was there anything different that you had to do to onboard there? What was the process like to become a team in that environment? Yes. So there's the standard background check and all that stuff because it is a juvenile court setting they want to make sure that you haven't been convicted as criminal or any felonies or anything like that so it's a little just a slight bit more strict yeah but there are places that allow dogs just to come in that are not necessarily registered therapy dogs and to me i feel like if you go through a process especially with the organization like pet partners it makes me feel safer going in knowing that this institution only takes actual registered therapy dogs you have to show paperwork you have to show practice right. and things it makes us feel safer because i know that okay they've gone through the same thing training that we have right it, it gives you an idea of what to expect in terms of the behavior from their dog and their insurance coverage and things like that exactly yeah yeah definitely so you have two dogs volunteering in different environments how do you balance the right cadence of volunteering overall and then for each of your dogs that's a really good question. And it's something that I had to learn because yeah. it's so exciting. And there's so many opportunities here in Nashville that at first, like I said, I was just so excited to volunteer. And it's like double the dog, double the fun, right? And it is. It's a lot of fun. But I had to learn really quickly that I don't have to take every single opportunity that my own emotional health, I have to take that into consideration. So now we're a little bit choosier. To give you an example, we're doing five or six days a month, three per dog, two or three per dog. That's when we first start. And you burn out really quickly because I still work and I still have things that I have to do. And then you also realize this is volunteer. So you want to do it, but we're not a service to anyone if I'm perpetually tired or stressed out, you know? So I've had to learn to just be a little bit more picky. And the opportunities. So now we're down to like one or two a month. Okay. Yeah. You do one or two visits with each of them per month? No, one. <laughs> so it's either one with just Finn or one with Finn and one with Mark. Okay. Gotcha. Good for now. Also, life changes are a big thing. Okay. Like I recently moved in December and it took me four or five months just to decompose from that. So when you're trying to do that, trying to do visits, even though that's fun. It's just a lot. Yeah. You have to find the amount that works for you. That's going to be different for every single person. It's just learning what it is. Yeah. And it changes. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. It's not set in stone. Yeah. Honestly, June was a busy work month for me. So we didn't do any visits. In my coaching work, I teach Mm -hmm. this to people. You have to be very selfish with your own time. They always say you can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to fuel yourself first. And I always say on every flight you hear, secure your own mask before you affect others. So I feel like this is very much the same case here. If I'm not taking care of me well, then even though we're doing a lot of business and everything, it's just going to be exhausting and burnt out. And then the recovery time, as you get older, the recovery time is longer. So yeah, Jessica's echoing that sentiment in the comments saying it's important to be self-aware and self-care. Yeah. And then also here in the summer, the temperatures never usually get above 100, but the humidity is really hot in the summer. So a lot of times during the summers, unless it's an indoor event where I know there's air conditioning, we don't even consider it because I don't do well in the heat. 
they are small, so they overheat as well. They have Pomeranian fur, which is very thick. <laughs> yeah, so that's also why I have them do the teddy bear cut, but they do have the double coat as well. Yeah. So it's almost extra insulation. It's like wearing a fur coat all the time. Yeah, I used to live with a little Pomeranian, and he wasn't mine. He was my roommate, so, but he was always in front of our air fryer. <laughs> that was like his personal <laughs> fan. We're like, you know, that's not actually a fan, right? I have two air purifiers, and one of them is pretty much Monty's personal one. I just literally leaves the right next to it. It's so funny. We just thought it was the most hilarious thing because he just lays in front of it like it's his fan. You know what I love about dogs is they're so intuitive. They're hot and they feel hot, so they're just going to find the nearest coolest thing, whether it's like a cool floor or it's, you know, like an air purifier. They're just really resourceful like that. Yeah. Well, Levi says, thank you for, for sharing that information. And Jessica says, you are a great mom watching out for them. Aww, thank you. Well, I don't want to keep you here forever, but is there any advice that you have for someone who's interested in becoming a therapy dog team? I think the most important thing is to make sure you put yourself in that equation. You know, it's fun to volunteer with your dogs and it's so rewarding. Another story I can share is we used to volunteer at a rehabilitation center. So this would be where if someone had gotten into an accident, they're learning to use their limbs again, or they're regaining muscle. And we would literally go in there and they would say, this person's blood pressure was sky high, but now that they're petting, let's check their blood pressure. And it was significantly lower. So different things like that. That's so rewarding for me. I've always wanted to do meaningful work. So to us, that's really meaningful. But again, burnout is very real. And it's not something you can teach. It's just something you feel. So a lot of us, we just go, go, go all the time. And then the universe basically says, okay, you're done. That's when you get sick. And that's when you get exhausted and hopefully not collapse and do all that stuff. But really, your own health is very important. And to consider weather conditions, like I said, we don't do a lot of work in the summer because I don't do well in the heat. And if I'm not doing well in the heat and I'm clearly uncomfortable... Then might be having fun, but like I'm super uncomfortable and I'm over it. And then this is just not yeah. as fun. The other thing I would say is just have fun. This was something that our trainer told me. Yes, you have to go through the team evaluation and there's nerves that come with taking a test. But if you just approach it and you don't think about scoring, don't think about perfect score or all that stuff, you go in and you just go, okay, we're just going to have fun today. And then you talk like that to them. The test mirrors what you would see in a visit, basically. If you talk like you're doing an actual this, then it feels like a visit. It doesn't feel like a test, even though you're being scored. So because I've been able to go, okay, let's, let's go and have fun. And I talked to them. I'm like, all right, you want to go meet some friends? Let's go okay. see who we meet today. Let's go on a walk. Let's go walk over here. And we talk like that. And ironically, that's what gets us the perfect scores. Yeah. Because we're having fun. And it's just about having fun and making sure that he's safe. I think that's really important. I think any kind of test environment, there's a stigma that comes through it a bit. And so just, you, we forget to have fun. You just approach it like, this is just something fun. We're just going to go do something fun. Then it changes your whole attitude. Absolutely. I think that's a really awesome approach to testing. <laughs> well, because I test well, but I get nervous, like mm -hmm. all the nerves. And it's just about tricking your mind to be like, no, we're having fun. You really? know your stuff. And I think a lot of the nerves comes from confidence, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, I'm unsure of this. At this point, we've retested three times. We know the stuff. It's the same. Not very many changes have happened. Yeah. It's pretty much the same test. We know the material, right? right. So then it's just, let's just go and have fun. Yeah. I love that because you're right. Feel so high pressure. Like the rest of our lives depends on whether or not we pass the plans. But reframing it into let's go have fun and just pretend that we're on a visit is a really great way to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's what's for our. So. Yeah. No, I can see why. It makes total sense. Estella, is there anything else that you wanted to share while you're here? No, I just wanted to say thank you so much for asking me about my podcast, because when I first started it, I got the idea before the pandemic and the tornado even happened. And my initial response was, absolutely not. I'm not going to do a podcast. I don't like my talking voice. I'm super self-conscious. Talking into a microphone is just weird to me. You know, it's just all these different things. And I figured out in my own healing journey that under all of it, it was just that because I intentionally wanted to do a trauma-informed podcast. 
I didn't think that my own trauma story was worthy yeah. enough to sustain a podcast, right? Yeah. And so it was almost as if the universe went, oh, you don't think it's worthy enough? Here you go. Here's a tornado. Here's two floods. Here's a pandemic. He was like, are you good now? Are you worthy enough? <laughs> and then the home invasion event, you know, we actually had two home invasion events, one in 20, so one in 2021, Fourth of July, after all the fireworks and everything, somebody just literally had a key and just walked in. And it was an honest mistake. All the apartments in that complex look the same right. and all the layout. Babe. He literally just walked into what he thought was his apartment. But what I couldn't get over was why are there two different units that have the same key? You right. know? And so, yeah, after all of that, I was like, where was I thinking that I was worthy enough to host a trauma centric podcast? Because, I mean, certainly I've been through all of it and I mostly interview people. But then in season two, I started to include my own feeling journey and do solo episodes because I feel like that lets people know that I'm not just telling you a bunch of stuff that you can try. It's sure. like, no, I've lived through that. Like, this is how I'm navigating it. And just to let them know that it's cyclical. It never truly goes away. You're never truly 100% healed from your, but you can get to where life becomes manageable again. Sure. Yeah. But thank you for asking me about that. Yeah, I'll have to go check it out. It sounds like a really yeah. important thing to listen to. Yeah. So. Thank you. Some of the episodes, I will say, trigger warning, some of them are hard to listen to. Yeah. So take breaks. But mm -hmm. I try to keep the episodes 40, 50 minutes, never more than an hour, because it's hard to listen to. And I'm very sensitive to that. Yeah. And if people want to find your podcast, where can they find it? If you go on Apple, Spotify, it's also on iHeart, Amazon, all of the things. It's Finding Strength of Heart. Mm -hmm. And here on Instagram, it's also at Finding Strength of Heart. No punctuation, no underscores. Or anything. Okay. And if they want to follow Monty and Finn's journey, they can find you at Therapy Palms here, yeah. right? We're beside you right here. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Estella. It was so great getting to know you today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Make sure you tell your pups I said hi. He says bye. Bye, cutie. <laughs> He's like, Ma, you woke me up. Say <laughs> okay, bye. Well, take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.